Hello and welcome to the My Ministry Mission Podcast, where I'm taking you on a journey with me from unbeliever to disciple of Christ. As a Christian learning in the faith, I try to tackle challenging and difficult topics, and I want to share with you what I've discovered as I seek a position of ministry in my life. I'd love to hear from you, so join me online at myministrymission.com or find my social media links in the show notes. My name is Jason, and this is my mission. Welcome to the My Ministry Mission podcast. My name is Jason and I'm your host. In Matthew 16, 24, Jesus teaches us, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. The whole purpose of the cross was executions. It was an agonizing and a painful way to be put to death, and a man condemned to die this way was required to carry his cross to the place of his execution. Now, denying oneself doesn't mean we have to sacrifice everything we enjoy. It means we are others-centered instead of self-centered, and this brings its own joy. But Jesus did this perfectly, and he was the only one who's done this perfectly, but, but we're called to do this to the best of our ability. Now, taking up the cross represents giving up our lives to Christ, letting our old selves die, and being reborn in the image of Christ. Now, this often requires us to make sacrifices, and today's episode is centered on some of the sacrifices we may be called to make in our personal relationships with others in this world as we step into the light of Christ. Now, it's not all bad, though. I'm going to also talk about how living in Christ has strengthened some relationships and build stronger familial bonds. Now, this topic hits home for me because I had to make the choice to stand firm in my faith despite the possibility of losing an old friend. So keep listening and let's see if this episode resonates with you and maybe offer some comfort as you continue your walk in the faith. As we go about our lives, and during the passage of time, we'll experience different seasons. Hobbies may change, interests may change, and our perspectives will shift as we navigate these different stages of our lives. Now, these changes can impact our relationships, more specifically our friendships. So I'd like to outline some interesting data I found on friendships before I really get started in the episode. Now, on average, we replace about half of our close friends with new ones every seven years. I mean, people change, people move, major life events happen, like getting married, having children, and so on. And studies have actually shown that when you or I become romantically involved, one or two people, be it a friend or even a family member, will become displaced. Now, if you think about it, when we make friends... There's really no ceremony to bond the friendship together. We find a random person, get to know them, and they become a part of our lives for a period of time. Maybe for life, maybe not. But on the flip side, these friendships can also end without notice or even a reason why. There are some real benefits to having good friends. It's good for our health. Having a strong support system helps us overcome illness better. And believe it or not, hanging out with friends makes us look more attractive. That's true. One interesting fact I read is that on average, the number of friends we have stays about the same throughout our lives. If you have a small circle of friends, or maybe a large one, that's probably going to be the case in the future. And on average, a person makes 396 friends throughout their lifetime. But the strongest friendships are made between the ages of 18 and 26, because during that span of time, we're more likely to be adventurous, to try new things. Over time, our lives and our commitments tend to make our free time shrink, so we have fewer opportunities to go out and make friends. Now, this may come as no surprise, but women are more likely to value friendships that are based on an emotional connection, whereas men are more likely to value friendships that are activity-based. But I read a statistic that made me a little sad. Now, according to a 2004 study from the American Psychological Review, the average number of friends that Americans have has fallen by a third in the 20 years prior to that study. Now, that study was done almost 20 years ago. I mean, true friendships are are on the decline. That's not good. But here's one thing that was really interesting to me. The maximum number of casual friends or meaningful contacts anyone can have is 150. Now, this magical number is referred to as Dunbar's number, named after British anthropologist Robert Dunbar. 
Now, Dunbar did some research on non-human primates and concluded that the size of the neocortex in relationship to the body is linked to the size of the cohesive social group. But he found this, there was this remarkable consistency around the number 150. And this leads into the social brain hypothesis, which suggests that primates need larger brains because their form of sociality is more complex than any other species. And that kind of ties to the Dunbar number because it indicates that our social circles exist in this layer. Our tightest circle of loved ones is usually five people. And then from there, we have 15 good friends, 50 friends, 150 meaningful contacts. There's that number again, 500 acquaintances and 1500 people we can recognize. Now, the hypothesis suggests that people will migrate into and out of these layers of friendships, but the displacement needs to happen when somebody moves into one of these circles. Meaning if somebody moves into your your good friends category, one of your good friends is going to either move up or move out. Now, tying this into this episode today, I'm going to be touching on friendships in the in the context of how they change when one of those friends becomes a Christian. I'll also touch on other relationships, but this episode was predicated from a situation I found myself in with someone I called a friend, and I'll explain more about that later. Before I get too far, though, I I do want to say this. Biblical friendships are very important. They are friendships that are rooted in a common faith in Jesus Christ, and they serve to bring glory to Christ. That being said, not every friendship you have needs to be a biblical friendship. I have a few close friends who are not in the faith. And they're good people, and I love them dearly. But one of my favorite Proverbs is Proverbs 13.20. Walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. If we choose to associate with wise men and women, we'll grow in wisdom. And this is a good companionship to have, and I believe we can have non-Christian friends who bring wisdom in certain areas. And we can learn, certainly learn something from them. But what we want to avoid are the fools who are rooted in destruction. We also want to be careful not to confuse good, non-biblical friendships with a friendship rooted in corruption. 1 Corinthians 15.33 warns us, bad company corrupts good character. Of course, the most important relationship we can have is with Christ. But outside of that, I believe we Christians should center our most meaningful relationships between each other in Christ. But what happens when you're like me? I grew up in a household that didn't go to church, we didn't read the Bible, And by the time I came to the church, I already established a long history with a close group of friends. Now, when one person undergoes a conversion, in my experience, faith will have one of two impacts on an existing relationship. This may seem obvious, but I'm going to say it anyways. It can either strengthen them or it can put a strain on them. Now, at first, I was very awkward in my faith. I felt out of place talking about God and mentioning scripture, It took me a while to settle into my faith and get to a point where I am unapologetically Christian. So at first, there wasn't much of a change in those relationships. However, over time, I began to tell my friends and tell my family about my rebirth. And for the most part, I was pleasantly surprised by the response. Now, my mother, who I rarely talked about God with, was shocked at first. But then we started having these long conversations about scripture. She got herself a Bible and started reading it. And many of my friends admitted that they were also believers. Now, one friend, and I do hope she's listening, actually came back to the faith, even though her previous experiences were very unfavorable. Now, all of these relationships grew stronger as we were all united in Christ, and I feel closer to many of these people than ever before. But as for the non-Christian friends, sometimes they can be a salvation story. I mean, the best example of this that I can think of is C.S. Lewis. His conversion from atheism to Christianity wasn't the result of a sudden epiphany. This conversion took place through a number of conversations with many Christians over about 15 years. And each one of those conversations played a small part in the process. And he went on to become a celebrated, if not one of the most celebrated Christian authors of the 20th century. Now, one such influence was his friendship with uh, and conversations with author J.R.R. Tolkien. Now, my point in bringing this up is to illustrate that of the many reasons we shouldn't isolate ourselves into an exclusive circle of Christian friends, because you never know what part of God's plan you might be playing a role in. You might be somebody's token and be an influence on another person's journey to join the faith. That being said, there have been challenges and there was a strain put on a couple of friendships. 
Now, these challenges surfaced when they spoke poorly of the faith, or they chose to live full-time in a sinful life. So my question was, what is the role that I play as a man of God? In 1 Corinthians 5, verses 12 and 13, Paul teaches us, It isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders, but it certainly is your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. God will judge those on the outside, but as the scripture says, you must remove the evil persons from among you. Now, at first, I was a little confused by this last part. You must remove the evil persons from among you. So I did a little bit more digging. And what Paul is trying to teach us here is that Christians are not called to pass judgment over those who are outside of the church or those unbelievers. That's God's job alone. But we are called to judge those inside the church. We are called to hold each other accountable. And when someone is continually participating in sinful acts, we should stop associating with them. Now, remember what I said a moment ago, 1 Corinthians 15, 33, bad company corrupts good character. Now, there are a number of circumstances that might lead to the end of a friendship, uh, even one with a very long history. Now, I think there's basically three ways that a friendship would end. Uh, The first is that we choose to end the friendship. And the second is that the other person chooses to end the friendship. And the third one is that the friendship just organically ends over time. I mean, that seems a bit oversimplified, but at the core of it, that's really the primary ways friendships end, right? So let's start with the first one. When is it appropriate for you or I to tell someone that we need to go our separate ways? Well, the first thing we have to do is recognize that we are in a bad friendship. Now, you may be surprised to know this, but the Bible can help here. Proverbs 12, 26 teaches us, The righteous choose their friends carefully, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. Now, we've already covered how good friends, good companionships are rooted in wisdom. Likewise, bad friendships or bad friends do the enemy's work and they lead Christians astray towards the way of the wicked because of foolishness. Now, this is why Proverbs 13.20 tells us that a companion of fools suffers harms. It leads us away from Christ and into the enemy's hands. Now, there's an overarching theme of wisdom versus foolishness. Now, wisdom comes from living the word, living biblically and in close proximity to the Lord. Foolishness is corruption and wickedness, and it is Satan's way of pulling us further from the Lord. Now, if you have a friendship and you are constantly feeling that ick of discomfort at what this friend is asking you to do, or or where they're asking you to go, or how they're speaking, this is a good sign that it's a bad friendship. And this could be a fool doing Satan's work or trying to lead you away from Christ. Now, this is a person that you should probably put in your rearview mirror. Now, another verse that teaches us about bad friendships is Proverbs 28, verse 7. A discerning son heeds instruction, but a companion of gluttons disgraces his father. Now, I keep focusing on wisdom here, but this is another example. Obedience is proof of wisdom. Those who claim to be wise but are living disobedient lives are demonstrating their own foolishness. Those who squander life, food, and instructions, these are fools that shame us with the Father by association. But here's another one, Proverbs 29.3. A man who loves wisdom brings joy to his father, but a companion of prostitutes squanders his wealth. If you have a friend who is living a life of low character, your companionship with them is showing the Father that maybe you don't value wisdom. You don't want to live in wisdom. Walking away from a friend such as this and living a life of wisdom brings joy to God, brings joy to the Father. Now, I'm sure you've heard the adage, Choose your friends wisely. Now, there's a lot to be said about this. And again, your friends don't have to all be godly men and women. They don't have to be in the faith, but make sure they're not pulling you away from the faith. Now, I know it hurts and it's hard to confront somebody that you call a friend. It's hard because we have spent time building trust and building a relationship. And now it kind of feels like we're violating that trust by standing up to them. But please remember that our trust in the Lord must come first. And anyone who tries to stand between us and our God is not people we want to call friends. Now, the majority of my non-Christian friends are very supportive of my faith. Even though they don't share it, they they support it. And I I even had a friend give me a ride, and he changed the music because he was worried that it offended me. And I felt that was very considerate. Now, I enjoy having good people in my life, even if they're not Christian. And I never know what role I might be playing in God's plan. I've mentioned that before. Uh, by having these people in my life. So how do we know if it's time to actually let a friendship go? 
Well, I mean, the obvious sign would be that they are consistently pressuring you to behave in a way that compromises your values and your beliefs. I mean, another good sign is if they mock your faith or show disdain for your beliefs, or if they just engage in behavior that goes vastly against your faith. Now, that last one is a bit tricky here, because one could argue that by virtue of being an unbeliever, they're probably engaging in behaviors that go against your faith. And you may have to let the Holy Spirit guide you here. But if you've made the decision and it's time to end a friendship, well, here's my advice and take this with a grain of salt. First, be honest and be direct about your concerns. You don't have to be mean. You, you probably shouldn't be. You should be assertive, but not mean. You could start with something like, you know, I need to talk with you. I, I have some concerns about how your behavior impacts me and my faith. And, and then kind of go from there. Be prepared to talk about it right then and there, because generally people don't like being left hanging with that kind of news. Next, be sure to explain that you care about them and show that you care about them. But from where you stand, the friendship just cannot continue in its current state. Be prepared to explain the state, whether it relates to how they, they mock your faith or how they pressure you to behave in a way that's harmful to your relationship with God, or that they're doing things that you just can't support. Whatever it might be, be prepared to explain it. And then at this point, depending on how the other person values you personally and the friendship, the conversation might be headed towards a conflict. Don't engage in conflict. If it gets heated, just simply state that the friendship is over and you would like them to cease all contact with you. Remember, at this point, it's not a negotiation. You're setting boundaries that directly impact your relationship with the Lord. Alternatively, the other person might be willing to adjust behavior and, and maybe apologetic towards you. Maybe they didn't realize it. And if that's the case, you have to, again, seek the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Do you believe that this person is sincere? Well, maybe. But I've also seen those situations where that person will show contrition and then eventually backslides into their previous behavior, and this becomes a cycle. And that's not a sustainable friendship. And the last thing you want to do is pray for them. Always, always pray for people. And if possible, continue to be a positive influence, but maybe from a distance. Now, sometimes we find ourselves in a situation where we're not ready to end the friendship, but we do need to set some boundaries. And those conversations can be similar and that's where I found myself not too long ago. Now, I won't go into too many details, but an old friend of mine asked me to partake in a ceremony that went against my faith. Now, understand, we haven't really talked to each other in quite some time. But I tried to explain that my life was different now, and that I probably shouldn't be attending. And I got this message asking for more information so they could buy plane tickets. So he didn't get the message the first time. So what's a Christian to do? Well... The first thing I did is I sought wise counsel from others who had some spiritual maturity. Proverbs 12:15 teaches us, the way of the fool seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. As hard as it was to hear, I listened to the advice of my Christian friends and I finally sent a message back and let him know that I would not be attending the ceremony, that it would be out of alignment with my Christian values. And then I kind of cringed and waited for the reply. And to this day, I haven't really received any feedback from him other than a request from somebody else for my mailing address to send me some information, which I also haven't received. Sometimes when we stand up for our faith, we lose friends. Now, it could be overt. The other person can tell you that it's over. They're done with you. They're not your friend anymore. But many times it, it can just slip away without any formal notification. Just as there's no ceremony to start a friendship, there's no ceremony or formality to end one. And at first, it was hard for me to wrap my mind around what had just happened. But over time, I believe the Lord granted me some peace of mind. I soon realized that I was being asked to not only be tolerant of, but to celebrate someone's sinful lifestyle. Yet there was no tolerance offered for my lifestyle. In 2 Timothy 3.12, Paul teaches us, In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. I have been a Christian follower for three years as of this episode, and I'm just starting to understand how this works. But I also want to remember the words of Jesus in Matthew 15.44, But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. I will be praying for my once friend. So now I'd like to move on to faith's impact on some familial bonds. Now understand, family conflicts go way back to, I mean, to Cain and Abel. And this may be a bit of an extreme example, but you get the point. 
Some family conflicts are unavoidable, especially when we consider that while we may choose Christ, others in our family will choose to reject Christ. In Matthew 10, verses 34 through 36, Jesus illustrates how his coming would split the households. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to this earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own family. Now understand that Jesus' message was one of peace, but he knew it would call for individuals to be fully committed to him. So yes, this is a message of peace, but it it divides people between those who choose it and those who choose to reject it, even within the same household. However, a healthy family will provide room for each other, for, for the members of the family to express themselves, their feelings, their opinions, and their desires in a healthy and safe way. But just like our friends, we can run into irre- irreconcilable differences between family members that center on faith. Jesus ran into this with Matthew. Uh, Matthew 13, verses 53 through 57. Coming to his hometown, he began teaching the people in their synagogue, and they were amazed. Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't this his mother's name, Mary? Aren't his brother James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Aren't all of his sisters with us? Where did this man get all of these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own town and in his own home. When Jesus went home to those familiar with who he was growing up, they did not appreciate who he really was. When he revealed himself, they rejected him and even resented him despite his wonderful teachings and the miracles. Look, our families may follow a similar behavior when you or I go home and tell them about our faith. They may reject that part of us, even if it makes us a better and more loving person. They probably do this because they have known us before we became followers of Christ. They were comfortable with who we were, but not so much who we've become. This is also true with friends. So we may have unique challenges relating to anyone who was closest to us before and after our rebirth. Now, when we find ourselves in this scenario, this puts a heavy strain on those bonds and those familial bonds and those friendship bonds. So again, I ask, what's a Christian to do? Well, we pray on it. We pray for them. Be gentle when you speak on it and ask God to give you the right words. Remember Proverbs 15 verse 1, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Remember Colossians 4, verses 5 and 6. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. And then remember 1 Peter 3, verse 15. But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Now understand that I'm not suggesting we should be timid about our faith. You and I should be grateful we live in Christ and we we have heard his message. I won't ever apologize for being a Christian, but that doesn't mean I have to be aggressive or confrontational about it. But just like with our friends, there may be times when we have to invite a family member to no longer be a part of our lives. And that's really painful. But if they are trying to get between you and the Lord, then it's your responsibility to make sure that doesn't happen. That being said, you might be surprised at how supportive and loving a family can really be. In my case, I have family who have joined me in Christ, and other members of my family who aren't quite sure, but they are very supportive of my decision. There are family members I no longer speak to, but that started long before I started my faith journey. But if you do find yourself immersed in support you're going to find that those family bonds grow stronger. And the last topic I'd like to touch on is marriage and faith, but more specifically when one person in a marriage converts to Christianity. Now, unfortunately, this is not a topic I can speak on with any degree of personal authority. However, in 2 Corinthians 4.16, Paul warns us, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? Now, this is a reference back to Deuteronomy 22, verse 9, which prohibits yoking together two different animals. 
And it represents joining together two things that really shouldn't be joined. Now, this is helpful if you're not already married. But on the surface, the intent seems clear. Christians and non-believers should not get married, right? Well, Paul had more in mind when he wrote this. His intent was to caution us about the environments we live in. If we are being pressured to conform to this world, it gets in the way of us being transformed. If we are to join together with unbelievers, it presents a risk that we will live in ungodly ways. Now, Paul seemed more concerned about the influence, but he's not suggesting we should never associate with unbelievers. Now, the focus here is the difference between us being of the world and us living in the world. Remember what Jesus told his apostles in John 15, verse 9. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Look, if you're married to somebody and you convert, and he or she does not, this is a tough situation. Uh, And I'm certainly not suggesting you get divorced. In fact, the best advice I can give you is to continue to pray for your spouse. If he or she is willing to go to church with you, encourage that. But be gentle and speak the Gospels, live the Gospels, but don't force the Gospels. Let God do his good works, and you might be surprised what happens. I know somebody who recently invited God into their hearts to join their spouse in the faith after being married for many, many years, but it was through love and prayer that this happened. It was moving him towards God a little bit at a time, and if you're married, be true to that marriage under biblical authority, which means you see the marriage as a sacred covenant ordained by God for life. Deciding what to do with some of our relationships after converting can be very challenging, and it it can be very painful at times. But understand this, you and I are called to love each other as Christ loved us, regardless of our personal relationships with them. If you lose a friend or even a family member, there's probably a good chance that it was simply because you developed a very different value system after you joined the faith, not because you stopped caring about them. And when our value systems change, those around us can either choose to respect that, choose to join us, or we may have to choose to let them go. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up the cross and follow me. Look, being a disciple of Christ is not going to be easy. It was never meant to be easy. It was never going to be easy. But check out my episode on the Farewell Discourse. It's episodes 31 through 35. In his final discourse in intercessory prayer, Jesus warns his disciples over and over again that they will face challenges. They will face persecution and hate. And a lot of that's still true to today. Look, the enemy will do everything and anything to separate you from God. But if you keep Christ's commandments, if you keep in close proximity to the Lord, he will protect you. Now understand, this protection is spiritual. Now, bad things can still happen in this world, even if you're doing it all right. But as you travel through your faith journey, know that joy will always be there for you, even if happiness isn't. Now, joy will always give you hope through faith. New people will fill your life with an abundance of blessings, so don't be afraid to join a church or become part of a faith community. I I get it, not all churches are the same, but there is a home for you out there. Be brave enough to search for it. So just so you know, I've done a few cosmetic updates on the website to clean it up a bit. I'm still working on it, so expect some changes. But be sure to visit me at MyMinistryMission.com. You can find all of my social media links on the website, as well as in the show notes of this episode. If you have an idea or would like to send me uh, some feedback or just a comment, click contact me on my website, because I would love to hear from you. If you're interested in coming on the show as a guest, fill out the guest interest form at myministrymission.com slash guest. Look, I'm still working on a couple of episode ideas, so come back in two weeks to find out which one I landed on. Until next time, remember to love each other and may the Lord bless you and keep you. Thank you again for listening to this episode. If you have any questions or comments, I urge you to visit my website at myministrymission.com. You can click the contact button or you can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash myministrymission. Remember to pray and remember to love God and each other. My name is Jason and this is my mission.